I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Before I get started, I just want to suggest that you find something useful to do. I don't use any kind of graphics. I don't even know how to do a simple graph. So there is nothing to see here, people, other than a talking head. You might as well get some dishes done, go and cook dinner. I think that education, in my vision of it, would be people who were young people working out in the fields and who had their little headsets on, and then they would come together and talk about whatever they had learned. What I'm doing here isn't entertainment. That's too much pressure. I'm educating. What I'm doing is taking my 65 years of all the books that I've read and all the ideas that I've had from them and all the ways that I've been putting things together and I'm trying to have that conversation. So it's better if you are listening in the back of your brain and not necessarily engaging, but just letting things seep in. I also hear the latest way to listen to me is while fishing, according to Oscar and Leo. And I'm going to suggest that for Jake. If we can spread the idea that my voice helps to catch fish, I'm sure we can double my subscribers. Today's topic is C.J. Hopkins and the New Normal Reich. On Through the Looking Glass, the substack of Margaret Anna Alice, she does something called Dissident Dialogues. And this one, she did a Q&A of eight different questions with C.J. Hopkins. Now, I feel like C.J. is a secret that everyone else knew that no one told me. And it is a juicy one. He is so funny and such a good writer and so insightful. And the interplay between him and Margaret is magnificent. Margaret really catches the reader up because she does extensive quotes and different ideas that she summarizes on CJ. I hear that her article from CJ is 12 to 15,000 words. So I'm going to be giving you the cliff version of those questions and answers, and then I'm going to be putting in my ideas because CJ talks about some things like reality. And you all know that's one of my favorite topics. CJ's substack is called the Consent Factory Essays. And from that, he's taken one of his books called The New Normal Reich. I want to talk about the old normal Reich because I think it's important that we get clear and honest about what really happened the first time before we can take any lessons from that for ourselves. And then he has ways that he agrees and disagrees with Matthias Desmond, who has written the uh, totalitarian, uh, the mass formation psychosis, and I want to dive into that also. And then he looks at how do we shoot out the tires of this totalitarian drive. And you all know, I've got some ideas on that. So let's dive in. Margaret's first question is that CJ grew up in the 60s and 70s, and she wonders how does the cultural zeitgeist and transformations of this era differ from then? What CJ says is that he feels that one of the most important differences is that that time was dominated by two opposed ideology, the U.S. and the USSR, and that now the USSR is no more. And so we have one global capitalist ideology, something that he abbreviates as Globocap, and that that is unprecedented, that we would have one unipolar ideology. I think the point that CJ is making is a really critical one. As I say in my book, How to Dismantle an Empire, I think we're at the culmination of 35 centuries of the concentration of power, a concentration only made possible by the invention of money, by this abstract idea that gave people power over other people that they could never have if they were just trying to do it militarily. 
So that created all of these different layers of administration and servants and servants over slaves and one pyramid that was all serving that one empire. So when people look at, oh, this is just a terrible time. We just have to get through this. It's much more important than that. I think we're at the turning point because when you reach the culmination of anything, the only way to go is down. And so I think the empire is disintegrating, that it's dismantling itself and that it's really important for us to recognize that this is a unique moment in history and that things that were never before possible are going to be possible very soon. I also want to let you know that these quotes are all in my Substack version of Third Paradigm, although all of my commentary is only here. So Margaret's second question was, do you think that the new normal is a hegemonic mashup of ideologies like fascism, by which she means global cap or global capitalism, and socialism, which includes things like wokeism and new critical race theory, or are those ideologies irrelevant? CJ's answer is that that's what makes this time so different, that 20th century ideologies were all about those different terms and trying to sell those ideas. But now the market has replaced any of that, that what it is, is a values decoding machine, which I think is a fabulous term, that it takes all those values out so that anything can mean anything and anyone can be anything. And so that interchangeability that it doesn't matter if an idea is right or wrong, what matters is, does it sell? That is an equality that we've never seen before. I think that CJ is exactly right that capitalism and money itself is a values decoding machine. My book borrows primarily on the foundations of David Graeber and his book, Debt the First 5,000 Years. In that, he talks about how debt and slavery rip people from their context, their inherent value as a neighbor, a son, a father, a mother, a daughter, a sister, a brother. These are our inherent value. And that instead, it turns a person into a commodity. And a commodity can be exchanged. One is worth something of the other. That's something that in our hierarchies that aren't just capitalism, that are built on ideologies, they have different ways of calibrating what your value is. It may be how close you are to the king or how where you are in a religious hierarchy. But money is a way of measuring that calibration. It breaks everything down into equal little increments where that kind of commodification is possible. And that's why we're in a time when that has reached its extreme. And then Margaret asks about reality. She gives three different citations of CJ's work on reality, which she puts in quotes. And I read those. And then she asks, is the manufactured reality the same as the reality control from 1984? So from one of those citations, The War on Reality, CJ writes, for most people, for most practical purposes, reality is, well, reality. It's objective, material. It actually exists. It exists independent of our beliefs. It isn't just an arbitrary, empty signifier that doesn't actually refer to anything, but which we use strategically to assert authority or to impose ideology on society. If that were the case, there would be no reality. Nothing would be true. Everything would be permitted. But just imagine for a moment if that were the case. 
if what determined reality was actually just a question of power rather than facts. And then he answers Margaret's question that reality is always manufactured collectively by society. That concept, reality, in quotes, is not static. It is constantly revised according to the ever-changing needs of whatever system dominates the society in question. The 1984 comparisons are apt. Global capitalism is just the first system that has had the power and means to achieve that globally. We aren't there yet, but that's where we're headed. So in A Course in Miracles, which I talk about often, the introduction says, this is A Course in Miracles. It's a required course. Only the time that you decide to take it is optional. Free will doesn't mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means that you can elect to take whatever part of it you want at any given time. It says that teaching the meaning of love is not what it's about because that's our birthright and that's beyond the scope of the course. What it does is remove the obstacles to love. That the opposite of love is fear, but the opposite of what's all-encompassing can't really exist. And so the entire course can be summed up in two sentences. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. If we look at reality, which is not in quotes, as what exists outside of our bubble, outside of that our entire consensual reality is something that is like this little bubble that is in the middle of what's actually real. When people have looked at this mass psychosis that we're under, what they know is the power of the mind to delude itself. And it's just a little hop, skip, and jump to recognizing that this whole world could be our collective delusion. If we are one mind, the world can exist in our mind rather than our minds existing in the world. So I think we're in the middle of the potential for a great breakthrough on that because never before have there been so many people who are psychoanalyzing humanity as one consciousness because we're all trying to figure out how do we wake people up? How do people get this? What can we say that's going to help? And that psychoanalysis, I think, is exactly what we need. In order to keep these concepts of reality in quotes and real reality clear, I'm going to substitute mass psychosis for reality in quotes. Margaret's next question is, how does the Russian variable factor into your understanding of the post-ideological landscape? I recognize this isn't any longer about democracy versus socialism, but is it that Putin, and by extension Russia, is one of those rogue characters threatening reality from within? CJ answers, yes, Russia is one of a handful of countries that have yet to be completely absorbed by global cap and thus continues to behave like sovereign nation states, at least occasionally. Global capitalism isn't a bunch of bad guys sitting around in a room conspiring. It's a complex economic ideological system. Russia is both a component of the system and a pocket of resistance within the system. At the moment, it is flexing its muscles in an attempt to preserve what sovereignty it has left. Note how these pockets of resistance, Russia, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, etc., are portrayed by the global capitalist propaganda machine not as geopolitical adversaries, but as criminals, as threats stemming from within the system. This is something I address at length in my episode, Russia, a wrench in the reset gears. So I think you have to look at Russia as a different thing 
after the U.S. sanctions that have freed Putin from the oligarchs within and also from the petrodollar without. He's not just doing something different to establish himself as a nation state. He's also providing support to everyone else who wants to do that. So we're in a completely different world and it is this overreach this pyramid that has built itself too high that is creating all the pressure that I think is going to end up flattening the whole thing and enabling all of these people to escape. And I think it's Russia who's going to be the key to doing that. Margaret's fifth question. If GloboCap manages to corral everyone into a digital buyer surveillance panopticon, isn't that a great phrase? Will we go from being 1930s Germany to 1940s? Will they give up on the illusion of freedom? And CJ answers, new normal totalitarianism and any global capitalist form of totalitarianism cannot display itself as totalitarianism or even authoritarianism. It cannot acknowledge its political nature. In order to exist, it must not exist. Above all, it must erase its violence. That doesn't mean global cap won't transform whatever remains of society into an enormous biosecurity dystopia where a perpetual state of emergency is in effect but it will be a smiley, happy biosecurity dystopia where we'll still be physically employed in the organic fabric paneled ergonomic cubicle farm or infantilized officeless campus of some subsidiary of sub subsidiary of some transnational corporate behemoth or investment bank or whatever. And then he adds, and bugs, yummy, yummy bugs. Both Margaret and CJ have been criticized for comparing the current time to the Third Reich. I'm going to criticize it from an angle that is far more controversial, that I don't think we're giving Hitler and the Nazis enough credit. Do we really think that World War II is the only war in U.S. history where they are telling us the truth? What are the odds of that? So, if we look at the time and what created the Germany of 1930, we need to look at Weimar and the hyperinflation. How did that happen? World War I was a decision by the emperor of Germany. Now, there's no illusion of freedom there. There's no pretense of democracy. That is your government ordering you into a war. That war was decided by the Reichsbank that it would be funded entirely through foreign debt. Now, how does that work? That means that you as the emperor are taking all of your subjects as slaves and you're basically putting them as collateral and their children and their children's children on a bet, on a gambling chip that you're going to win this war and that the spoils are then going to go to you. So that bet lost, obviously. And in return, they had to pay back that debt and they had to pay reparations from the Treaty of Versailles that were equal to three times the value of everything within Germany. Those debts and reparations were both denominated in gold, of which they had none. And so they had to keep creating more currency in order to buy foreign currencies to pay off the debt, which then increased the cycle of inflation. Michael Hudson talks about how debts should never be denominated in a foreign currency, that it is a form of currency colonialism. So then when they kept manufacturing more money and were ordered to stop, they ended up occupying Germany to make sure that the coal was then being extracted and shipped out to pay directly for those debts. So their food, we all know, you know, a wheelbarrow full of 100 million marks couldn't buy a loaf of bread. So 
their food, their energy, all of those were taken from them. They were in the middle of a German genocide by the bankers against their people. Then they came out, the bankers, with the Renton mark. The Renton mark was a mortgage mark, and it was pegged to gold and the U.S. dollar, but it was backed by the mortgages. And so a mortgage was reinstated at 25 billion times its former value. Now, the advantage of an inflation is that it makes debts easy to pay off because there's so much money in circulation that you can just get rid of that debt. This made that into no advantage of, at all, that essentially all of the property within Germany now became part of the payment to the bankers. So what turned that around? In Web of Debt, Ellen Brown quotes economist Henry C.K. Liu that the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933 at a time when its economy was in total collapse with ruinous war reparation obligations and zero prospects for foreign investments or credit. Yet through an independent monetary policy of sovereign credit and a full employment public works program, the Third Reich was able to turn a bankrupt Germany stripped of overseas colonies it could exploit into the strongest economy in Europe within four years, even before armament spending began. And then she quotes Hitler in saying, we were not foolish enough to try to make a currency backed by gold of which we had none, but for every mark that was issued, we required the equivalent of a mark's worth of work done or goods produced. We laugh at the time our national financiers held the view that the value of a currency is regulated by the gold and securities lying in the vault of a state bank. So what happened when in between 1938, when Germany had a thriving economy without the British banking system and Hitler was Time Magazine's man of the year and 1939 when he invaded Poland? There's some piece of the puzzle here that we're not being told. And I would never have even thought about questioning the Holocaust until they made it illegal to question the Holocaust. Now I want to know anything that they tell us we are not allowed to question, there has to be something there. Margaret's sixth question looks at Matthias Desmet's mass psychosis and how that leads to totalitarianism. And she says that what CJ believes is that that's the reverse. It's a chicken and egg and the totalitarianism actually leads to that mass psychosis. I'm in agreement with CJ on this. I think, as I say in my book, that people are inherently good and when we behave badly, systems are to blame. We've been held hostage for 3,500 years by this totalitarian system, this system that co-ops us and forces us to do things that then we have the cognitive dissonance that we have to justify. And that requires that we don't see what's right in front of our face. That's something that we are, I think, about to come out of. Margaret then asks, why is it that in times of crisis like this, it brings out the sociopathy in some people while other people are resistant to conformity? I think that we need to be really careful about that. My youngest daughter says that people think that they could never fall for a cult, but they just haven't met the right one that we all have that cult message, that narrative that we can be bought by. And I think in particular, the cult that is your own cult of you is the most dangerous and seductive of all. So if we're going to not 
fall for it. We have to push against any idea that we're superior because of our ability to see things. We may be seeing one thing and missing something entirely other. That's a way of making, I think, ourselves immune because it's always superiority that is the thing that tricks us into saying, okay, I'm going to recognize your superiority over me and I'm going to adopt your ideology and that's going to give me superiority over them. That whole way of thinking, I believe, needs to be rejected. CJ's answer to that is that totalitarianism is like a truck that's barreling towards us and that what we need to do is not try to wake up the passengers or the driver, but to shoot out the tires. And Margaret says, but how do we do that? That's where I think you really can't criticize anyone else for not knowing what do we do about this? What's our vision if you don't have a vision? So I think that the work that I'm trying to get started where we look at how would we create this alternative reality? How would we have something in which everyone is equal and where work is the thing that backs our economy, not gold, not foreign bankers, but our own labor. I think that's the vision that we need to promote because you can't motivate people through fear. Fear is just going to make people shut down. What you can motivate them with to wake up is something worth waking up to. And Margaret's last question was for CJ to summarize the theatrical performance that has been his work and his life. And I will let you read that on my Substack, but I think that's a great analogy for looking at bringing real reality into this reality of the world, that we are all just players in it, that this body is a role in the dream, and I can use that role in the dream, but I can't identify with it because I am the dreamer and you are the dreamer, and we need to be clear that there's no role that's any more or less important or that's any more or less us and who we are in that dream. Anyone that we disparage is disparaging ourselves. I am so grateful to Margaret for introducing me to CJ, and I will be reading everything that he writes with great relish from now on. If you'd like to go deeper into the reality in the world, this is Russia, a wrench in the reset gears. And if you want to go deeper into questioning the reality of the world, according to A Course in Miracles, God asks only one question. Are you ready yet to help me save the world? Thank you.